Our liberty depends on the freedom of the press. This is a famous quote of Thomas Jefferson. He's a relevant person in the politics of the world and also known in the United States of America very much so. Now, here in Ghana, there's been recent concerns about some form of a dip in the freedoms of the media. We've taken it upon ourselves to make sure that that particular situation doesn't pretend. Today, we take it back into history a little bit. A people that spearheaded it. The fight for media freedoms in this country includes one of the people who is my guest on the show today. To tell us about what happened prior to we going to the Fourth Republic and the many fights they had to put up. And you'll be giving us a fair assessment of how media developers have come so far and the state of the Ghanaian media. After the break, I'll introduce to you my extraordinary guest on this particular conversation today. You welcome back. This is Upfront. My name is Raymond Alqua. Tonight on Upfront, I did tell you that my guest has seen it all. Now, he was there when we were transitioning from the um, military period into our Fourth Republic. Indeed, he was one of those who were part of the fight for Ghana to make it into the next phase of its development and all through. When it comes to the fight for media freedoms, he's seen it all. My guest today is Ebo Kwanza. Veteran, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, he really still manages, and I've been saying that veterans of his kind retire four or five times before they finally retire. He's been managing the Chronicle newspaper. And if you know the history of the Chronicle newspaper, it's one of our foremost, very relevant, investigative newspapers that this country produced with a lot of brush up with government over the period too yeah, when it was exactly, doing some, exactly. so much of the work. You're welcome again, sir. Thank you very much. I hope you are in good health. Well, um, at my age and disposition, yes. every year without a tombstone is a milestone. Oh, that's wonderful <laughs> to know. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. I need to quote you someday on this one. <laughs> anyway, but I want us to go back into the years and uh, start from prior to the Fourth Republic. Yeah. The military period, and of course, somewhere in 1989, there was also this uh, newspaper license and law, no, exactly. which actually made it very difficult for people to practice, and they yeah. had to use sports papers, exactly. and yet had some columns that were determined to produce political commentary yeah. in and of itself. How was those periods like for journalism well, in this before, country? Before you know, I go on. Today is the seventh anniversary of the unfortunate death of that's the, true. That's true. Mills, and uh, Prof was my, you know. Uh, Prodigy. I mean, he was someone who used me for all kind of purposes. In fact, I see. <laughs> and this is better agenda. I think I was used as one of the guinea pigs. <laughs> the so, better Ghana agenda. Exactly. Oh, I see. And the uh, new NDC. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so uh, on the seventh anniversary, I hope and pray that the Almighty who mm. finds space for him. He's been uh, one of the pillars of our That's democratic true. dispensation. That's true. And um, I only hope and pray that someone will uh, master the courage one day to mm -hmm. investigate the circumstances and that, you know, silence is death. The a president uh, cannot be sent to hospital in that circumstances. I wish and pray that we know the truth. Mm. Nothing but the truth. You think that's something beyond what is going on? Well, I suspect, I've it. always been suspecting that, uh, I mean, the president could not have been treated that way. No. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard Kukua and Indo who complaining today that uh, the NDC virtually abandoned us in the park. And uh, anyway, there are a few things that need to be unraveled. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to believe so. Well, that's interesting. Is the Chronicle taking it up? I mean, you have spearheaded oh, well, and investigated uh, 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 Every anniversary of his death, I used to, you know, write a column. Yes. Unfortunately, they have not been well of late, so oh, okay. I've been uh, home for quite a long time. Okay. I hope and pray that next week, you know, I'll be okay to maybe, you know, write something and uh, remind uh, the general population of a few things that happened. Mm, and I hope and pray, as I said, I hope and pray that someone mastered the courage to tell us the circumstances that this is dead. Because a president, a, a president who was not well being sent to hospital could not have been sent in the circumstances that happened, you know, in the case of Professor Moss. Well, that's interesting to know. Now, I want us to have this conversation. I asked you to go back for me. Yeah. Tell us, how was journalism proud to the Fourth Republic? Well, um, I have uh, seen quite a few military games anyway. Um, I started journalism under Champong, mm -hmm. and it was a very interesting experience. I, I mean, see. 
Um, at a point in time, I, you know, work for Ghanaian Times, you mm -hmm. know. At a point in time, all the state newspapers were used to campaign for, yes, that is uh, a tampon's concept Unigo. of Unigo. Okay. Some of us said no. I mean, I... I abandoned Maybe when you wait for this. Oh, yeah, yeah, I abandoned office the several times to work at people, no. And on a day of the referendum, that was the very first time I voted in my life. Hmm. And I've never had a, a happier moment than just taking in the new, okay. you know, uh, symbol. I know this, you were required to, if you voted yes, you were required to put the no in an acid. Mm -hmm. If you voted no, you are required to put the yes in an acid. Mm -hmm. um, I voted no, retained the yes ship and came to the office. The editor at the time, Kwame you know, called uh, the time meeting and asked whether everybody had voted. And I said, yes, I voted. In order for you to know that I voted no, this is a yes no. Well, the ballot wasn't a secret any longer. No, 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 no. I wanted everybody I see. to know. Oh, okay, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful to know that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, 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 those were the very turbulent times, I must say. Um, Nanado was the uh, general secretary of PMFJ, People's Movement for Freedom and Justice. Yeah. And some of us were his brother boys. We, we were going around, you know, uh, um, you know, giving our leaflets here and there, okay. you know, that sort of thing. That's how it began. That's mm -hmm. how some of us were drawn into, you know, the political game, though okay. we are not politicians. That's true. <laughs> it's a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, um, then I was a sport journalist. Before I, I, I let you move on, for mm -hmm. those who did not know the action of that particular grouping you just mentioned, the movement that was opposed People's to... People's Movement the, for yeah. Freedom and Justice. This the, was a group opposed, opposed to union government. Union government. Because government. we saw the union government as a concept uh, by which a champion wants to uh, legitimize its illegitimacy. And again, union government was the military permanently having a place exactly. in the it, governance exactly, of the state. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. I see. So there were contestations between these two groups. Yes, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Ghana has gone through several turbulent times. Th those days, you know, from campus, you know, on campus, university campus, students were, you know, um, every now and then the army and uh, and the police, especially, would descend on them for dissenting uh, on the yes vote. Mm -hmm. You know, on the street of Accra uh, and several places, they they they. Policemen were harassing people, ordinary Ghanaians who, oh. you know, uh, identified themselves with a no concept. Okay. Yeah, but it was, uh, looking back, it was very interesting times, you know, and uh, we went through that until the uh, AFRC, yeah. uh, the day of the rolling school. I, up to now, don't understand the meaning of the Holy War that was launched. And up to today, if you ask me, I will tell you, it was a needless concept. But then, so a few people believed in it. Mm. Yeah, but um, that meant that uh, the media was stifled. Stifled then? Completely. I uh, mean, under the AFRC? AFRC, PNDC, it was worse. Mm -hmm. uh, the only media that were, you know, th those days, there, there, there were three st state media, four. The GNA, mm -hmm. the uh, GBC, and GB GBC Radio and TV. Uh, graphic and then the Ghanaian Times. Um, all other private newspapers were virtually sports papers because it was more. I mean, you 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 woke up, uh, you know, alive if you were a sports journalist than uh, a political uh, commentator or anything. Oh, I the see. The first person who suffered, you know, the casualty was uh, a man called John Kublino, and I feel very sad that the DJ. For instance, do not remember that person. John Kublino was the editor of the Free Press. Mm. Uh, he and his publisher, Tommy Thompson, were arrested and detained together with Mike, um, Michael J., who was the a columnist. Okay. Who wrote, he wrote a very turbulent, I mean, very <laughs> uh, a column that the uh, PNDC never liked anyway. Mm -hmm. So they were arrested immediately after the coup and detained. And uh, um, we used to visit them. Uh, Kublino died. Barely two weeks after release. Oh, okay. Tom Thompson himself hanged on um, uh, until he died, eventually died. Mm -hmm. Mike had to go into exile. I don't know. He came back, you know, sometime ago. I don't know where he is at the moment. But uh, those days, you know, you, you dare not stood against the regime. Mm. I, for instance, I mean, I for quite a long time, I was considered too dangerous to talk to even a reporter at my own Ghanaian times. Really? Oh, yeah. And... Uh, so how were you practicing the journalism? <laughs> For one and a half years, I was 
made chairman of Bluebirds. Bluebirds is a, a New Times Corporation football team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, my, my so, so, sorry, you have moved from active journalism yes. into first managing all, a football all, team. I was uh, at the sports department, and they said I was um, hiding under sports to criticize the government. Sorry. Okay. You welcome back. This is up front, and let me apologize for the slight mess up there. But, Mr. Kwanza, you were telling us that you, who was the journalist, was moved De to deputy sports editor, then made deputy news editor. I was moved into a newsroom first. Y yes. And my job mm -hmm. was to uh, brief reporters before they go out every morning. Okay. And then when they come back with their reports, I mm -hmm. go through with them mm -hmm. and then prepare the, the, their uh, content for the tutorial conference. Okay. Yeah. Um, it got to a point in time, you know, when the editor decided that, you know, he saw my ghost in the, in the reported stories. <laughs> <laughs> so you were influencing the stories. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. <laughs> yes. yes. So, you know, uh, I was considered too dangerous at the time mm -hmm. to talk to reporters. That was your job? That was my job. But yes. you were considered I too dangerous to do just go on to going to live on to train you know in complication and come back oh, okay and I, I was i thought i could be more useful to my, yes. my organization mm -hmm. but rather they saw me as uh, too dangerous, dangerous to mm. talk to reporters so uh i was made chairman of blue best football team that is the our football club in yeah. new times corporation i see i did a very good job of it you know? <laughs> i went and brought a, a number of blaster players you know employed by times and they played for blue best we won the national league that's a real league and knockout. That's interesting to know. Oh, yeah, it is very interesting. But, uh -huh. uh, at a point in time, uh, one day, I think one day, you know, no, before then, uh, I believe you know a man called Jared Yes. A lawyer yes. who yes. became a member of the uh, Yeah. You know, um, at a point in time, the um, secretary for PNDC was Mr. Zayebo, who Zayebo. was a very good friend of ours. Yeah. So he came around and said, we should do a probe into Sport Council. You know, to and I said I didn't want to serve his government, but he said you know he wanted to know how the sports council, you know, was the strata everything, so that um, he could know what to do. So we conducted the probe. But I told the probe members included uh, the other uh, general secretary, myself, Kusi uh, Pratu, who's been my classmate, a very good friend, mm. uh -huh, and uh, one other person who is now born abroad. In the course of the probe, I told them that look, the government wasn't going to publish our report. And so we should be careful what you know we did. Well, we came out with it. We went and banded copies at the Institute of African Studies at Lebanon and kept two copies each. But um, the day the report was supposed to have been released, there was no report. There was a white paper saying that the government uh, had accepted our report and that uh, some people, some personnel of the Swarth Council were to be moved, to be removed. The chief executive was to be uh, uh, sacked on our, you know, recommendation, okay. a number of people to be transferred, and I, and I said, no way. You That's know, not in your report. No, 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 that wasn't in my report. So I managed, those days it was um, a hell, uh, getting a full page in Ghanaian Times. But mm -hmm. I managed, I got the advert department to remove all advert pages on the sports department, okay. uh, the sports pages. So I wrote, and uh, uh, um, I began by quoting Hanare, sorry, Benjamin Be Aquino, who was then the opposition leader of the um, Philippines. Oh, okay. He was arrested several times and uh, asked to denounce his criticism of the uh, Marcos government mm. as conditioning for his release. And he said, quote, there comes a time in a man's life when he, he must prefer a meaningful death to a meaningless life. So that's how I started my story. Mm -hmm. And I said to me, that time has come when instead of um, condoning the act of official that be to enjoy their blessing, I feel it's a duty to let the truth prevail, no matter the consequences. I see. So I said in pizza, we said this, we didn't say this, blah, 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 blah. And somewhere I said, I said, um, perhaps all this existed in the figurement of men who are ready to take drums. And, and then I ended... Not clearly directed at the PNDC. Oh, of course, it. yes. I ended by quoting Hannah Arendt, an American political commentator, who said, quote, truth and politics are on rather bad terms with each other. No one, as far as I know, has ever, um, has ever saw truth as a political ally. Since for the brief moment of politics, truth has a despotic character. It is therefore hated by tyrants. Mm. That's how I ended my story. I knew the next day I was in trouble. 
lo and behold, I was in trouble. When I got to the office, there was a peace goer waiting, so I knew. But uh, thank God, the person who led the, uh, there were two man uh, military officers who came in. The person who led the group was uh, Abdullah Sani. Abdullah Sani used to be a goalkeeper for the Blasters. Mm. We knew him very too well. So and was he a military man then? Yeah, yeah, he was a okay. sergeant. In, you know, a sergeant in the army. Okay. You know, he was playing for defense stars at mm -hmm. that time. There was okay. the, the army team was in the league. Mm. Uh -huh. So Abdullah Sani came and said, "Look, uh, they wanted me all over the place. Uh, <laughs> Bema camp." Uh, castle, the Minister of Information, but he saw the Minister of Information as a safe place for me, so he okay. take me there. But then, uh, until Joyce I was the secretary for, in, uh, okay. for uh, information. information. When I went, and he said, "Oh, the bad for you, ah, you, 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 what should we do to you?" I said, "What have I done? I only wrote the truth. You know, this is what." The, and he said, "Anyway, I should go back to the office after a long chat. He called me several call. I should go back to the office." And that editor would talk to me. When I got to the office, my uh, editor was waiting. He said, the government likes you and that he wants uh, you to go to China to learn revolutionary reporting to uh, help the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting development. Uh, yes, I, yes. Said, uh, you know, I said, uh, me going, for, okay, we, we shall see. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, lo and behold, uh, the PND Secretary for Youth and Sport resigned. Okay. Right? He gave me a copy of his resignation letter. Those days, it was uh, it was sacrilegious for anybody to contemplate a PND cinema resigning. Mm. The, the, what happened was that they, they usually said the, the PNDs are relieved so and so of his membership. Yeah. So I think that was what they were scheming to do. And I felt it a duty to let people know that That's man had resigned. Has resigned. God <laughs> Almighty, being uh, a Ghanaian alive. <laughs> uh, one day, I was just in the office when the editor came and called me and said, Ebu, uh, there was a champion of champions between us and Kotoko and uh, 11 wise, secondly. Mm. And that um, uh, there's no senior man at the sports department, and he thought uh, I should go and report, but I should be careful what I write. I told him, Thank you very much. <laughs> I knew my lead story already before yeah. I went to the stadium, as a matter of fact. But the game had not played. Uh, no, no, no. I knew my lead story, as a matter of fact. I see. So I came and wrote my story. I said, the chairman of the PNDC, Fly Lieutenant Jerry Rollins, presented the champion of champions to Santé Kotoko, with the secretary for youth and sports, constitutionally absent. You brought in that point? Uh, yes. And I said, uh, the second paragraph was that a man, you know, when the PNDC came to power, they completely abandoned, you know, the football, the the main football stream, you know, suffered a jolt. And okay. uh, instead they, they promoted what they call sport for all, like MP and those kind of games okay. at the, the stadium. Indigenous Ghanaian games. Uh -huh. yeah. And a number of them, a number of other games. So I said the man in charge of propagating the PNDC policy of sport for all was nowhere near the stadium. The entire paragraph, in fact, he attended the examination three weeks before Tema Rollins made the presentation, before the football followed. Mm -hmm. Oh, so your first lines were about the resignation yeah, of the... Yeah, which very, was very important because I wanted the people of Ghana to know. There was a resignation. The PNDC member had at least the line. Okay. Sort of being, you know, this Relieved of his membership. Relieved of his post and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I knew there would be trouble. At, apparently in the night, the editor decided to go and... He remembered that I was reporting. And mm -hmm. decided that ah, he went to the office to find out, go and find out what had been reported. Mm -hmm. And then when he read the report, he said he should step the whole back page down. And the story was whole back page. Mm. You know, they should step down and replace it with something. But there was nobody to do the replacement. They stepping down, the, the technician could do it. By replacing, there was nobody, nobody to replace it. it. Yeah. So eventually he decided that they, they should scrape. You know, those they were using metal, you know, they were very, so they should scrape the part which said the man has resigned. So they scraped that part. So the first two paragraphs were there. Hanging in and the story and the rest. So the next day it became more problematic than any. Uh, I see. The, the PNDC itself had to issue a statement that they never, you know, censored the media. And that if there were problems, they should ask the editors. They issued a statement saying that? Yes. Okay. Because it became a, a you know, content, contention in town. That is a vacuum in the story. Uh, yes, yes. That, uh, because if you follow, the, there's something and you see the gap. Mm -hmm. So that was when uh, they decided that I was too dangerous to even write. 
So I should become chairman of the, uh, of the of Rubes. Oh, of the football team. Yes. So, well, I was there, you know, one day I went to town. I met a very good friend, a uh, friend and a member of the government at the time. Uh, on campus, used to call me against because they were comrades, and I've, I've never believed in, in that comradeship. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> you know, yes, I hear you. He said, Against, um, uh, you know, hey, against, he said in three quietly, What are you that I used to that around? Ah, me the, you know, me catch all. That was sort of a, a coded language. The next day I was in London. Oh. The next day I was left. in London. Yes, I left for London. I had only 50 pence in pocket and nowhere to go, but I arrived in London. How was this possible? I was it possible. Someone bought me a ticket. Oh, I see. Yeah, someone bought me a ticket. And someone ensured that, though the yeah, Ghana Airways manifest was full, someone ensured that I was on it. Mm. And I arrived at it through with 50 pence in the pocket and nowhere to go. You facilitated your own travel. That, that's what I'm saying. That, that uh, you know, uh, those days, incidentally, most Ghanaians don't know. Those days, you, uh, you didn't need visa to get to London. It was just like uh, I could ask you to call you. Okay, I see. Because it was okay, okay, all Commonwealth countries were required to, you know, if you want to go to London, you get there and then tell them, tell the immigration officer what, you know, brought you there. Mm -hmm. And the immigration officer will make a decision. I got there, football has always been good to me. Mm -hmm. I got there, there was this immigration officer who scanned through my, my passport and said, oh, you've traveled mainly in Africa. What do you do? Then he saw journalist. What brand of journalism? I said, oh, I'm a sport journalist. Then he said, oh, I'm a sport fan. <laughs> I support Liverpool. Oh, and I, see. I also have always supported Manchester United as a kid. Mm -hmm. so I said, I support Manchester United. He said, Sunday, Manchester United versus Liverpool, Liverpool at Anfield. He said, see who, is, who will win. He stamped six months and gave it to me. Mm. But it was then that I, I, I didn't know where I was going. But you had, <laughs> you had gone to the UK, but I didn't know where you were going. No, no, no. I mean, I had no plan of going anywhere, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out. And, uh, you know, I had, as I said, I had 50 pence in pocket. So I decided to go and change the 50 pence. I knew one or two people being the number. So I decided to call. I was in a, a booth. When a friend, you know, who was the general manager of um, uh, Ghana Supply Commission in London, came with the uh, uh, wife, you know, they, they wanted to meet someone at the airport. The person didn't come, didn't come. And the wife insisted that, ah, they look like a book is in the booth. So they came, saw me, and said, ah, let's go, let's stop whatever you, you are doing and let's go. So that's mm -hmm. how I got to town. I got to town. The next day, I called one or two people. By the end of the next day, I had 130 pounds. In pocket. In fact, my first article in London, I wrote for 50 pence to 130 pounds, pounds in one day. That is quite a journey. <laughs> <laughs> that was indeed quite a journey. <laughs> but I, I did us to fast forward to the yeah. time where. So, what time did you come back? I came back um, to edit the Chronicle in 1997. 97. Yeah, the United States. That's an interesting development. Yeah. But you were still following developments from. We there. were, you know, look, I ran the Ghana Democratic Movement in London. As, okay. Yeah, as the project officer. I was sent there by. Refugee Council to run Ghana Welfare Association, but uh, mm -hmm. what happened was that in the day it was a welfare association, in the evening it was a democratic movement, which uh, was a political movement. I see. So it was running a twin <laughs> agenda <laughs> exactly, for them. Exactly. Okay. Th and I was all over the place on refugee forum. forum. Mm -hmm. I went mm -hmm. all over the place. In London, I stopped the World Bank conference on Ghana in London. You stopped? I stopped it. You know why? They sent um, an American who was the resident director of World Bank here. To come and address us, inform us about how well the economy of Ghana was doing. So I got up and asked a few questions. I said, look, uh, before I ask my question, let's agree on a premise. I'm a Ghanaian, full-fledged mm -hmm. Ghanaian. I come from Kufinko, for my mother, father, born there. Mother, I traced my grand, you know. And I said, the speaker is an American. If the economy of Ghana is doing very well, I mean, I think it should interest me more than him. Yeah. And that I'm putting it to him that is. Um, only interest in Ghana is that he's earning wages we will not have earned anywhere but for being resident director in, in, in Ghana. In a country where, you know, the, the, the budget has just been read and since that, you know, gone up. Okay. So I mentioned that actually a number of since that had gone up. The whole conference, you know, rambled. People got up, they asked him questions and the whole conference collapsed. That's, that's yeah, the next day, the, the next day um, a fatwa was issued on me by the Ghana High Commission that I should never be allowed to enter any Ghanaian uh, uh, function. Never? Never ever. But they were calling that they, that was London, Britain. And they would not I, obey such They didn't rules. own most of the halls that those events took place. Okay. 
And I went and, uh, you know, literally I did a few jobs for BBC and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other things. So I registered with the NUJ, National Union of Journalists. And mm -hmm. all you needed to do was to quote your NUJ number. You called the hall, you quoted your NUJ number and said, I want to attend this guy. But then they will, you know, facilitate your entry. I see. So invariably, you know, uh, though they wanted me out, by the time they come there, I was there. Every other, every, every, every other event. program. Every other program. So, you know, London was an exciting place in the, in, the, in the sense that we demonstrated a lot. We drew attention of Ghana to what to was happening in what Ghana. Was, uh, what was happening in Ghana to the international community. Oh, yes, yes. I remember in 93, um, then the finance minister, the Robuchi, came to address the Confederation of British Industries, you know, conference in, on, on Ghana in uh, London. And we demonstrated against him throughout the day. Throughout the day, we organized a demonstration. Then he came out and we surrounded him, organized a demonstration here and there. He said his briefcase was missing. And the police in Holborn, a suburb of London, you know, wrote to us that uh, some of us should come and uh, clear our name and that we've been linked with the stealing of the briefcase. minister's briefcase. Um, I was then a uh, London correspondent of the Daily Nation of Kenya. You know, Kenya. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was the uh, land correspondent. Mm. You know, for quite a while, and uh, the owner of uh, the, the the Daily Nation, is a Pakistani. I don't think he's dead now. Is uh, is a Pakistani who had a big business interest in London. So mm. we had a big office at Warren Street, the centre of London, and uh, I had my cubicle there. One day I got there, and my managing director, who was a woman. Uh, called me and said, uh, Ibo, they, that's how they used to call me. Mm -hmm. Ibo, the police are looking for you. And in Britain, when the police are looking for you, for a black person, it's a serious matter. Mm -hmm. You must be involved in a crime. Mm -hmm. no. So I said, you should wait. But all along, I was plotting what to go and tell the police. Mm -hmm. I was plotting, plotting, plotting. Then one day, I hit an idea. So I got to the office. The police called. And uh, I said, I'm coming. I said, are you coming yet? So I went. When I went, there was a big boardroom of 12 top policemen, British policemen. Immediately I got in there, they said, Mr. Constantine, what do you offer you? I just uh, put my head down and said, a bottle of whiskey, sir. A bottle of whiskey? Yeah, I, that, that was part of my thought. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And he said, uh, what do you need, need whiskey for? I said, I need to be off my head in order to meet 12 top police officers. Yeah. Because in my country, even in Accra, I don't... I, I'm not a frequent visitor to the police station. Yeah. So I need to be off my head to meet 12 top police officers. And in any case, I said, give me a cup of coffee. So they gave me a cup of coffee. Then produced a letter from my high commission saying that uh, my minister's briefcase was lost and 12 people who were the suspects. I was number two. First was I, Ebo. Number two, Ebo Kwanza. Three, um, three um, was this boy. Um, uh, he was even chief director at the Ministry of Tourism and Industry. Uh, ODK, Udru oh, yeah. and uh, up to 12. So I started by asking them, uh, has anybody been to Africa before? One guy just got up and said, yeah, he's been to Africa. He's just come from Osaka about two weeks earlier. I said, good. Someone who lives in Accra and another person who lives in Osaka, who can come by a briefcase is there? And so okay, London is all over the place, even downstairs. So I raised my briefcase. I said, I bought it downstairs. Why would I need my minister's briefcase? So I took opportunity to lecture them on what is happening in, in, in Ghana. Ghana. I said, what they're looking for is not a chief. You are looking for political activists who want to end military dictatorship that has been initiated by a captain. I said, look, uh, is there any, please, uh, all of you here, is there anyone whose rank is a captain? He said, oh, we are all above captain. I said, what is happening in Ghana is the equivalent of a captain overthrowing the queen. They all got up that it could not happen in, in, in London, okay. in Britain. I said, but it has happened in Ghana, and that's what we are fighting against. You see? So the long and short of it is that we used our you know, presence in London to draw attention to what was happening in, in Ghana. Yes. So what made you come back to Ghana? Um, Kofi has been my very good friend. We all are Kofi people. People don't know that. He yeah. comes from uh, uh, Nakwa. The father comes from Nakwa. And uh, we've been very close for some time. In London, you know, we, anytime he came to London, he called me. When I was going to set up the chronicle, he called me. He said, uh, hey, but why don't you come down and set up the chronicle? I said, look, if I come down, though we, uh, I myself, uh, my safety could not be guaranteed, 
Secondly, uh, no one is going to give you license to operate your, your chronicle if I am involved. Yeah. So you go and set it up. So he set it up and he kept calling me. So one day I decided that I would come. He called me on Thursday. I told him Sunday I'll be in Accra. So I went to uh, the home office. I was using British refugee passport. Okay. I went and said they should take their passport. I'm going to Accra. And that uh, this, the, the woman said, oh, but some of your friends keep them. Because, they, you know, it was they travel. I said, well, I'm going to Accra. I'm not going to keep quiet. And I don't want anybody to tell me I'm not a Ghanaian mm -hmm. because of a piece of paper. Take your document. I will, uh, anytime I want to come to London, I have to stay. So I will come. Don't worry. So I left um, on Sunday. Uh, uh, Sunday I left and I arrived in Accra here. Monday I was editor of Chronicle. We did a few days that you're talking about. Yeah. And which year was this particular month? January uh, 97. Okay, 97 was an important year because there's been elections after that. Rallis has actually gone yeah. back into yes. his career. That, that was a few, a few moments after uh, the famous shit bombing. You know, of <laughs> Chronicle and other Yes, yeah, so know. you came in after, <laughs> yes, after, that, that, yeah, after that. that. That's interesting. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when I came in, the first plot we, we organized was uh, to send um, a Christmas card to Kunedu. The first lady there? Yes. When I came, we started, you know, we started, before we broke up for Christmas, because, uh, I came, there generated 20 something, but I was not working. I, mm -hmm. you know, okay. said we should send a Christmas card to Kunedu. If you accepted it, it was good, good news. That Kunedu accept uh, a Chronicle card. Yeah. If he refused, Kunedu refused his card from Chronicle. Uh, so we had our little story before we went on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. And, and the same day we sent it, a, a, a full military officer, Lieutenant Kenneth Kusli, you know, came to the office. He was lucky we were not there. And returned it. That, uh, the, the, chief, uh, the first lady said he should return it. Okay. He was lucky we were not in office. Without well, reasons. a good picture of him. Okay. And in a, that's the, uh, the ne next publication, he and right uh, So the, 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 uh, the refusal of the Christmas card featured prominently you know, on our front page the next uh, It was headline news all over the place, you know. Uh, that the Christmas card has been refused. Yeah, uh, has been returned. Yeah, uh, people started saying all manner of things that they, you know, I mean. And, uh, you know, when I came, the GBC TV mm. and started the Big Fat Show. So some of us were the pioneers with this Big Fat Show. One day okay. I went and said an atrocious thing, and uh, uh, we were banned from entering the GBC. I, Kosi Pratt, and uh, uh The three of you? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Banned from entering GBC? Uh, yeah, from, from that program, because we were, you know, causing too much problems in this country. And that was the reason? <laughs> well, that, that, no, no official reason was given, but I had a classmate there who told me that any time we got there, you know, any time we left, you know, there were all manner of calls. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was the reason why the program was stopped. But anyway, it was an exciting moment. And when I became editor of Chronicle, I mean, uh, the NDC had set up, uh, you know, this. They had a law firm called what, what, uh, whatever, and they were taking us to court. They were the party had a law firm. No, uh, well, some members of okay, the NDC. Okay, 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 I will okay. say the NDC. Of course, I mean, yes. some members of the NDC had I a see. law firm, mm -hmm. and uh, they were just going through the Chronicle every now and then to see if something was actionable. And they went to court on behalf of people they had not even met. I see. Any point, and at any point in time, I had to, about 32 cases in court. Every morning I went to court before going before to do it. Before going to do it. Well, yes, yes, yes. And I enjoyed it. We were just going to court. Oh, because some of the... Uh, but there was criminal libel at the time. Yes, there was criminal libel at the time, you know. And, uh, well, if you want to talk about, about the criminal libel, that is very interesting because... Um, I was I was in uh, I went to London for a holiday. When I learned that Kogu uh, Bakun and uh, uh, Alaji Haruna had been yes. arrested in, in connection with the uh, you know, so I ran down immediately. We formed something called um, uh, something for free expression. There's the a forum, a forum for, for free, free expression. Yes, you know. Uh, Kwam Kakare was, you know, coordinating it, and uh, mm -hmm. we organized uh, uh, a match in protest against uh, the the, the uh, jailing of Kokubaku and Co. And when I went to Winneba and saw Kokubaku in that jail, I said, "This thing, you know, whatever it is, we will fight it to the hell." Okay. And, uh, thank it God. was a very terrible state. It was a very terrible, very ter prison is Ghana prison. Oh my God! I think someone. I hope and pray that someone does something about it. Look. I once went to Wemu's Club prison in London, top 
police uh, uh, um, prison in, in, in London, looking for a guy who had been arrested for um, sending uh, drugs to. Uh, and I had a long time with the guy. You know what he told me? I asked him what, what, what he's feeling and uh, you know, whether the family in Ghana were aware of his uh, presence in jail. He said, oh, here there is like Tamale Hotel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, two of us were in a room. They yes. told me two. Uh, they had their toilet. Mm -hmm. and if they wanted anything, they only signed for it. Mm. And I just like, you know, staying in a hotel in Tamale outside his uh, Kumasu home. I see. You see. But if you compare that to a prison here. Uh, yeah, of course, they are in a terrible state. We should do something about it. I think there should be a campaign. No, to do with the prisons. Uh, very, serious, very serious campaign to, you know. The media played important roles there. But would you say that the media then was reckless? No, at that time, we, I would say uh, we were reckless. I mean, it was important. Even there was, if there were recklessness, that recklessness was important to draw attention to what was happening. I see. It was very important that, you know, we fought the system and got... Uh, criminal libel and all those things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, criminal libel repealed and the media front, uh, you know. Uh, uh, would, you, would you also say that the media was predisposed to oppose the NDC mindful of its antecedents during the PNDC and the AFRC periods? Well, uh, af after all, uh, okay, uh, the media is run by human beings. And uh, if you yeah. suffered under Poncho's palace, I don't think you want you to praise visit, visit this palace very, very much. That's interesting to know. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So now, moving to the Kufour period, some have described, in fact, I've, I've spoken to Halal Jaren who says that that's the golden age of media practice in this country. And then, uh, well, before then, uh, let me comment on the, uh, the shit bombing, you know. Um, when the, uh, this shit bombing took place and uh, people were complaining, the minister in charge of local government at mm -hmm. the time, you know, said publicly that that was a rejoinder, people's rejoinder to uh, the specific articles appearing in the papers. I see. Yeah, I, I just want to note, for people to note that the minister of local government at the time... What was his name? Dr. Uh, the now Professor Kwame Hawaii. Oh, okay. Yeah. He said publicly that the, the, um, um, the shit bombing was p the people's rejoinder to stupid articles appearing in the papers. In the papers? Yes. But, but, but government clearly couldn't have supported it. The police saw they were investigating and they didn't get people to arrest in this particular case, as the report suggests. I think, you know, uh, the, the uh, truck that landed those ships were run by the AME. And someone controls the AME. You know. They were run by the AME. It was, it was AME truck. I see. Yeah. Interesting. It was AME but I still we couldn't get to the bottom no, of no, the no, 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 no. I mean, a lot of things. You know, I mean, those were the days when, you remember um, Ibrahim Adam, so Ibrahim Adam and if, uh, some ministers, you know, were involved in uh, some uh, problems and a charge investigated the matter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, after the charge investigated the matter and, uh, you know, uh, indicted these yeah, officers, the government issued a white paper on a report it has commissioned and said that, you know, it was the media that is to blame and not those officers. The media was to blame for it. Yes, yes, for, for you know, uh, uh, getting those things in the public in the first place. And let me tell you something that we did, you know, when I came back to land uh, from uh, Ghana, uh, that uh, is important for people to know. In 97, when I came, the year I came, you know, the story broke, a story broke out from Nigeria. That one Mr. Guazo, who was a security you know, a uh, couple of um, the military butcher of Nigeria, then Ab Abata, had come to Accra and, you know, uh, given our president at the time, Friday of the Rollins, you know, um, five million dollars. That's what we published. That was we broke out in Nigeria. We petitioned, I remember we petitioned parliament. The Abata five million thing. Yes. We petitioned, we published it. We first okay, broke yeah. the story. We petitioned, you know, uh, um, Parliament investigated the matter. No, Yasanan was my godfather. I went to school with the, the daughter and I used okay. to him every now and then. And he was the chairman of Ghana Boxing Promotion Syndicate that promoted DK Poison to win the first Ghanaian World Championship. Mm. So I used to go to him a lot. Mm -hmm. So I petitioned him and uh, you know what they said? That we were paralyzed. That's that why. Time. That time. It took 20 years for General Rollins to accept that 
some money was sent to him, but it was not five million, but two million. Recently. Recently. Yes, you it see. was not five million, two million. Uh, well, whatever. But at least that's what he said now. Yeah, but at least at that point in time, we needed him to tell us that oh, I got some money, but it's not in five million. It took twenty years. Yeah, so, it, so indeed, there was a request of parliamentary probe, which did not happen in the first. At this what I'm saying. Yeah. We 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 made so much noise, but there was no parliamentary probe. You know, and that we were told we were penalized. I see. We were penalized. It took 20 years. So it tells you that for me, I read that into the meaning of the Holy War. That all the Holy War was not about me and you, but it was about people's own welfare. Now, let me bring in this particular point. And I was asking about the Kofor period. Yeah. I mean, was it really the golden age of um, media practice? Well, Where media well, freedoms unfettered. Comparatively, yes. Comparatively, I mean, uh, nothing is perfect in this world. Okay. And, uh, you know, given the what had passed mm -hmm. and what had just happened under Kufuor uh, regime, uh, one could say it was golden age. But as I said, nothing was perfect. Yeah. But was, was the media pandering to the then government then? Well, it depends on where you are standing. If mm -hmm. you are, uh, you know, uh, one of those who. Uh, promoted the culture of silence, you will say the media is pandering to the regime. Mm -hmm. But if you are uh, one who suffered from the culture of silence, you will say Kufo's uh, regime was a golden era for media freedom. It's interesting to know that the likes of Raymond Archer, you remember the Gizori yeah, Archie period yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of the other events that happened there, yeah. they didn't show that they were that safe in the, the, under the tenure of President Kufo. Well, that's why I'm saying that. I mean, it depends on where you stand. Mm -hmm. I mean, if uh, I, you know, uh, never benefited from the culture of silence, okay. I think I suffered from the culture of silence. <laughs> okay, so if you ask me, yes. I'll tell you it was golden age. It was but good. those who benefited from the culture of silence could also tell you that it was a very dark age in our history. Mm. And uh, of course, so you're basically saying that the treatment of the government has not been equal when it comes to the journalism practice in the country. Over the years, mm -hmm. and at that point, I, uh, people should note that you know the media was used as part of the liberation movement. Okay. People like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, J.B. Dankwa, the evening news, uh, and you, the other people. You know, yes. uh, the uh, Azukwe, Namde Azukwe, mm -hmm. were all in Ghana here using the media to fight the liberation war. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the media has always been an ally of some kind of movement. Okay. You see? Yeah. So um, if uh, uh, to promote good governance, you know, as the, the regime promoted, if uh, people felt that they were helping to promote good governance, why not? And uh, Professor Mills, how is the media? Oh, Professor Mills is, I, I, I must say, Prof, you know, I just, you know, started by paying tribute to him. Prof, as a person mm -hmm. and as a leader, was you know a, a media friendly, media friend. I he called me several times. You know, people don't know, but uh, some of us were very instrumental in getting him from Legon to come to run Sports Council as uh, oh, okay. as the the, the uh, chairman of Sports Council, mm -hmm. and then he was spotted and sent to uh, IRS and all yes. those things. Mm. You know, I have been a very regular visitor to Professor Mills when he was in opposition. He called me very regularly, and uh, anything happening, he would call me first. He will, you know, I remember when I came from London and I was editor of Chronicle, we published a, uh, a story of um, armed guards at the castle, you know, uh, arresting civilians and locking them up in guard rooms at the castle. And at long time, they just pour soup on the floor for them to lick. Really? Oh, yeah, sure. Prof called me. I go, ah, what the mentality? And I told him that, you know, I gave him certain names. He, he himself found out and called me. Then he said, hey, someone asked him, you are in Okoro. I mean, that oh, what, you're, uh, what, what you're saying is true. And then I said, oh, you prof, you yourself, one day, when uh, they don't want your leg to touch the ground, you will feel the, the, the pinch. OK, now, that's an interesting development. Comparing Kofor's period to President Mills' period, which one was more fear? Oh, I think, you know, uh, uh, you see, in, uh, in, uh, uh, Professor Mills tried to promote, but anyway, the, uh, a number of elements who promoted the culture of the darkness were still around. Within President Mills? Yeah, exactly, time. within his uh, regime. But why Pre Prof was doing this, others were doing that. I think differently from uh -huh. that. So, um, 
Yes, he tried very much, but uh, I doubt whether uh, I could compare him to the uh, Kufo Kufo era. era in terms of uh, media freedom. How about the time President Mahama came in, replacing President Mills? Yeah, Mahama is a man of communication. I mean, mm -hmm. he's also a very good friend, friend of mine. People don't know that uh, he's one of, uh, uh, we, we get on well. I once took him to my village, uh, Akwambo, as president. I summoned him on the, on the phone and he came as president, mm -hmm. you know, as guest of honor to my Akwambo festival. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. And, so, uh, how was media freedom under him? Oh, yeah, yeah. He is a communication expert and uh, I think he, he will want to promote media freedom. But as I said, some elements of the darkness who promoted the, di the culture of darkness were still around. Lurking. If we joined President Oh, Mahama yes. Said. I mean, they, they were lurking around, you know, I mean. Uh, so there were one or two um, infractions, but I think he did well. He, compared to the uh, uh, first uh, term, first term of the first republic, I think okay. you I, know, I Mama did very well. Very well. Mm -hmm. Now let me come to President um, Akufa this period. Now the Media Foundation recently put out a list of almost forty-one different infractions against the media, yeah. from Ahmed Swali's death through to the recent modern Ghana issues. Does it shock you? Well, it doesn't shock me in the sense that Amal Swali's death, for instance, uh, has been a, a sore point in, in our, you know, uh, democratic and media, media friendly, you know, uh, mm -hmm. atmosphere. Um, it is very difficult to link that to media freedom or not because uh, up to now, nobody knows how he was killed, uh, no, who killed him and that sort of thing. I don't think it has. You don't think it's connected to his work? You don't think it's connected to threats that the, if, if the, the entity work, Tiger IP had received and all of that prior well, to this Well, I, I, I uh, would like to believe if it's connected with his work. It's not connected with his work as the media, you know, front. But, you know, uh, uh, in, this, in this game, uh, all sort of things are possible. I, I get your point. Now, th there's this conversation that, I mean, just two days ago, Dr. Rakubabe says that in this Fourth Republic, um, under President Akufuado, mindful of the different incidents of attacks, is to him the worst abuse that he has seen in this particular republic. Of course, he eliminates Rawlings' period out of the zone. Indeed, there are others who actually have similar comments about media freedom and the space being increasingly very difficult to practice. Yeah, it's not very. It's not the very best that you know the impressions uh, on media fr uh, freedom front. But uh, I don't think you know uh, they 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 are the work of the uh, um, the Ekufu government per se. I mean, th there could be elements lurking around and causing problems. Okay. There are no two ways about it. Okay. Me. But I don't think as a person, you have known Ekufu Adu for some time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I know his stand when it comes to freeing the frontiers for the Ghanaian to operate, okay. let alone the media. Dr. Rakubo says, says he felt the same way, but he feels that the president is watching so many things happen under his watch, which is problematic. Well, that, that, that could be a valid point. I mean, mm -hmm. that could be a valid point. I don't have any, any evidence to contract it to what he says. How do we make sure that the attacks on the media is reduced? I think we, were, we ourselves mm -hmm. have a lot to do. Some of the things we put out there are irresponsible, as a matter of fact. No, I see. A lot of things we put out there are irresponsible. We need, these days, you know, all you need to maybe uh, get empl employment on the tree speaking, uh, some of the, I don't say all, some of the tree speaking uh, radio, you should be able to speak well at the funeral. That's all. That, that's my concept. And then there is this concept of um, uh, mushrooming media, media schools. Mm -hmm. How can you go to school with excess? and study media practice for three months and call yourself a journalist. I don't believe so. You need to train and train and train. In this job is the training that makes you the, 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 what you are. It's not, you know, you don't go to, um, you know, some uh, place for three months. How oh, on this earth can you be a journalist in three months? It's not possible. I've run out of time, but unfortunately, we have to leave it off here. Thank you so much, sir, You're for welcome. gracing our studios. I'm sure it should be consistent so that we hear more from your know, rich <laughs> history and appreciation of these issues. Folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. My name is Raymond Alqua. Many thanks to you for joining us here today.